Retro Hangover, supported via Patreon by listeners like you. We would especially like to thank patrons Lyle McCarns, Ashton Ruby, Randall Quiggle, Tony G, Stud Still Smash the Milkman, Keith Gasper, Miss Peachy, JC, Megan Caruso, Mass Keaton, Andrew Laguori, Ozzy Garcia, The Retro Vixen, Adam from The Good, The Bad, The Backlog, Lunchbox, aka to The Scruttle Gamer, Discimera, Jenny E, Rick Firestone, Parallax Puddles, Soha, Dave Jackson, Matt, aka Storm Again, Retro Overdrive, B Ross and Van Fernal from Super Garbage Day, Raging Demon, Storm Beagle, The Emperor, Eric Guess, Nomad from the Retro Wildlands Podcast, Ash Event, Alan Bingham, Ryan Player One, Mike the Ref from Backbreaker Gaming, Darth Emic, Lo Five Alex, Alt, Renner Dreaming, and Oh Me. Your continued engagements and generous donations are deeply appreciated. Open your ears and crack some beers. You are listening to the most recent episode of Retro Hangover. Hello, retro and classic gamers. Welcome to the podcast where we make mega melodies melding meaningful macrology macromania. This is Retro Hangover. I am your co host, Chris Copleen, with special guest, patron bitch Rowdy Randall, and as always, your host, Shane Dick Bondra. You know, if 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 we had been recording this episode like, oh, I don't know, five, five plus years ago or something, I would have expected that the alliteration would have included something about like magnificent, massive mammaries or melons or something like that. But you know what? We didn't do that because we're we're older and wiser and more mature. No, we're not. No, we're not. Mature. Yeah, I think the only reason I didn't include memories is because I've been there before. I mean, so many times in real life, but on the podcast, <laughs> I have you also guys, done that. You guys, I've had so much before. sex. Like, you don't even know. So much sex. You don't know so her. Much. She goes to a different school. <laughs> You're really taking me back. <laughs> I got the callousness to prove she it. She lives in Canada. Yeah. With a jaw like that, I've seen South Park. That could be fun. Uh, but welcome to the show, <laughs> Randall. <laughs> By the way, if you're wondering why I called you patron bitch, it's some pre pre show uh, banter, but it's great to have you back. How are you doing? Uh, alive, kicking, screaming, all the fun things. Mm. As long as you're screaming. That's the important part. Beats the alternative. Not screaming. Being dead. I just feel like there are a lot of extra steps <laughs> in between those two. But yeah, I'd rather be kicking, screaming today, to be honest with you, all, because we are playing Mega Man Legends while well, we did play it. And we're here to talk about it. I'm playing it right now. This is. Yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> and this is a this is a game that was selected by our patrons as part of our quarterly poll and was nominated by Randall for the poll. And I am so happy you nominated this. I'm obviously you're I'm sure you're happy it won. That's why you're here. And I'm looking forward to talking about it with you today. So there you go. Mega Man Legends. It's just interesting because uh, like I was holding off nominating it for so long because I was like, yeah, nobody's going to vote for it. And I'm just going to have to like, all right, Chris, just roll me up for a year. I'm going to nominate it four times in a row because nobody's going to vote for it till probably the last one. And you're like, OK, put it up. And then it, I think it won by one vote or something. Yeah, I think it did. Yeah. Either, either one vote or was tied with Persona 4 Golden. 
and then we flipped the coin of common sense and it landed on Mega Man Legends. Yeah, you know, a seven hour, uh, you know, 3D action game versus a, a 100 hour cry fest. Seven hours, he says. That's those are rookie numbers. Yeah, I think I spent 14 on it. Say so on my playthrough right now, I'm at about 15 and still going. Jesus. Really? Oh, wow. You're completionist in this. Don't defraud any <laughs> donators on the way there. I'm gerarding the fuck out of this game. Allegedly, oh, no. I should say. <laughs> but before we get to talking about this game fully, uh, let's let's talk about the games that we have been playing lately, as we are wont to do. And we are going to be starting out with our guest as tradition dictates with Randall. So Randall, what games have you been playing lately? You're not going to like my answers because I have not put any time into digging into my backlog like I'm supposed to. You've been playing WoW, haven't you? The so mm. the only two games that I have played in the past what, what we are now we are almost to the 6th month of this year. Uh I have only been playing World of Warcraft. Path of Exile and Hunt Showdown. That is three games. I said two games, but I meant three. I know two of those games that you've been talking about, and I've played one of them. I mean, it's still been a really fun time, but I would definitely never recommend anybody ever get into MMOs. It's a, it's literally a sin, and uh, it kills me every day because <laughs> I'm like, oh man, I should go play something else, and then somebody in my guild is like, hey, you gonna get online and? Do a dungeon with me, bro. And I'm like, ah, I can't say no because this is human interaction. And that's why I play WoW is because you make connections with people and you don't want to let them down. And then you're like, I fucking hate this game. Dude, whatever, man. Just be like, go queue in the dungeon finder. Leave me alone. I, I, I guess I could tell them to do that, but you can't do that with Mythic Plus right now. Can't just mm. queue up for it. You have to you have to interact with people. It's so cringe. I hate people. Dude, what is this? 2004? Yeah. But yeah. So terrible. That's pretty much all I've been up to. It, it out of the three games that I mentioned, Hunt Showdown is definitely the best one that I would recommend people go play. It is not nearly as sweaty as some people make it sound. It's just a cool little uh first person shooter. But yeah, that's it. Is it a boomer shooter? No. I wouldn't even call it like a tactical shooter because it's not it's not super realistic. It's it's slow, so it's supposed to be somewhat realistic. But it's mostly like the theme and the fact that it's the wild, like the Wild West that makes it interesting. And all the guns are either based off of old, like real guns, or they're slightly modified real guns from back in the 1800s. Hmm. Can you get a fully automatic revolver? Fully automatic? Yeah. No. If you mean, uh, what, what is it? A double action revolver, which means it like the hammer flings back on its own. Without you having to cock it each time, sure, they have the semi-automatic revolver. There you go. What about a chain gun on the back of a spider mech? Well, they do have a chain gun, Ooh. but it's a handheld pistol, and it's just called the, I think it's called a chain revolver, mm. and that's also a really good gun. But no, there's no mini guns, Shane. No mini guns. What if I wanted a skin where I had a Whirly mustache and a top hat, but I had a mechanized wheelchair. So you joke, but they did just recently add a character that kind of looks like the dude from Wild Wild West. He's just standing, <laughs> not in a wheelchair. All right. I'm, gl I'm glad that you picked up where I was going with that. Yes. Now the song is stuck in my head. So wiki wiki wild. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, on to you, Shane. What have you been playing lately? Man, I've been playing this game called Mega Man Legends. Heard of for, it. For the PlayStation 1. It's pretty good. All right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, that's it. I, honestly, that's that's kind of it. Like it, I kind of joke, but also not. Um, I mean, other than that, I'm just I'm playing more Diablo 4. Uh, I'm trying to continue leveling my my season four necro my summon mancer um, actually at the time of this recording i think in about a week is the one year anniversary of diablo 4 already um and they're doing an anniversary event where like a bunch of treasure goblins and shit are gonna spawn like way more often and drop extra loot and it's gonna be cool so doing that d4 is in a good place right now so i'm having fun with it but that's pretty much all i got time for these days 
I mean, it's sort of in, indicative of that, right? That like I'm I'm literally playing the game right now that we're talking about. So yes, at least your thoughts will be fresh. Yeah, like super fresh, like sushi fresh, top shelf tuna right there, man. That's right. You don't want it decaying and stinking up the place. I do not want brain parasites. No, thank you. No. As for myself, I I don't know if I mentioned this on the last episode, but I have completed Valkyrie Profile. Mm. That game is done. Something should be coming down the line with that involving me. I don't know if that's... I'm debating whether or not I'm going to do a rapid fire review. I don't think that's going to be necessary based on what's coming up. I'll talk more about that coming down the line when, when things become more solid. Other things that I have been playing, of course, I played the game du jour. And Secret of Evermore for our HRC, our Retro Hangover Review Crew, which was nominated by members of our Discord. If you want to be part of that, head over to the Discord, because if you're listening to this, we've definitely started a new game. So go check that out. Just go over there and find out what the game is and play it and join us and give us a review. But uh, Secret of Evermore, I'm actually having a decent time with it. Our community uh, really railed against it at the beginning of the month. Everyone who got it done early. We had one person in our community, uh, Soha, that gave the game a zero out of ten, which that has to be some serious hatred. And a lot of other people gave it low scores, like sub fives out of tens and stuff like that. I'm playing through this. It's an all right game. I'm not going to say it's a great game, but uh, for the Super Nintendo, it's like a decent little action platformer. It has some flaws. I'll say this. uh, I'd rather play this in Secret of Mana. I'd rather not play it than Trials of Mana. I think Trials of Mana is a, it's a superior game, but it's definitely better than, than Secret of Mana the last time I remember playing that game. And that's considered to be like an all-time classic. I don't know why. Probably because of the multi-tap. And I don't know how many people actually owned the multi-tap, but I don't. that's why people love it. Uh, I'm enjoying it. I'm enjoying the graphics. The, the music's okay. The gameplay is, is solid when I can actually hit the enemies. And I'm really enjoying a Secret of Evermore for the most part. Not going to call it an all-time great. Not even going to call it great. I'll just say it's good. It's good. Uh, and I look forward to sharing my review over there on RHRC and, and nominating my game for the month. And we'll see how it does. I'm torn between two games. And if you're listening to this, if you want to know what the two games I'm nominating, because that, that time has already passed, it's between Alex Kidd and Shinobi World and Garo Mark of the Wolves. I'm not sure which one I'm going to nominate yet, but uh, you'll know by the time this episode comes out. But that's all I got. Well, all right. I guess in that case, we we probably ought to just get get right into things then, huh? Indeed. Chris, would you be so kind as to provide the fine people at home a little a little backstory, a little brief history, perhaps, of the game du jour, which just happens to be Mega Man Legends. Here we go. Having a franchise make the leap from 2D to 3D was something a lot of video game developers had to wrestle with in the mid to late 90s. This concern was accentuated even more so when Super Mario 64 came out to great critical and commercial acclaim. It was now inherent to every publisher that the popular games of old needed to dip their feet into the 3D waters, even if, in retrospect, their mechanics were better suited for 2D. Capcom's Mega Man would eventually find itself in this situation with producer Keiji Inafune taking the lead. He wanted to make a new type of Mega Man, one that felt radically different than the series before it, and wanted to make it a mix of various genres instead of the Blue Bomber's typical action platforming romps. In addition to action, Inafune wanted to incorporate RPG and adventure elements while appealing to a broad audience. While not much is known on the ins and outs of its development, the game would debut as a demo in E3 1997 under the original title of Mega Man Neo, a name that would apparently have some legs as a playable demo of Rockman Neo would be included in the Japanese version of Resident Evil Director's Cut. It doesn't look like that name was overly popular as there was a quick name change with the Japanese release on December 18th, 1997 where it was formally changed to Rockman Dash. There would also be another name change under consideration for Western audiences, including Mega Man Nova, before settling into what we know today. Mega 
Mega Man Legends was released for the PS1 in North America on September 18th, 1998 and December 4th in Europe, with an announced port to the N64 in development. Despite being announced in 1997, the N64 port wouldn't be released until November 22nd, 2000 in Japan and January 10th, 2001 in North America. The N64 port received another name change, aptly named Mega Man 64. It was received with mostly lukewarm reviews, receiving a 74% in aggregate for the PS1 and a 50% for the N64. Reviewers liked the game's weapons variations, story, and characters, but criticized the graphics and gameplay mechanics. IGN complained how the N64 version was disappointing, giving it a 4.5, asking why Capcom didn't change anything from the PS1 version, which they cited as being a poor experience. For the record, IGN gave the PS1 version an 8.4. In terms of sales, it did all right, selling about 850,000 total units on the PS1 and 220,000 units on the N64, which was decent considering the time of release and competition. Capcom was impressed enough with its commercial success that it would go on to receive two sequels, with Mega Man Legends 2 and The Misadventures of Tron Bon. Currently, Mega Man Legends is a bit of a lost IP last seen getting released in September of 2015 alongside its series members for the PS3, PSN, PS1 Classic series, and a third installment for the 3DS that was unfortunately cancelled in 2011. A spiritual successor of sorts called Red Ash was announced via Kickstarter from Keiji Inofune in 2015. While the Kickstarter was successful through dubious means, there have been no updates on that game since. And that is your brief history of Mega Man Legends. Good luck! All right. Thank you, Chris. You know, I, I don't know if it's just me, but I, I feel like this is another one of those cases of the, the working title being cooler than the actual end result. Like, Mega Man Neo sounds cool as fuck. Why did they not keep that? I have no idea. I think Mega Man Neo would have been a lot better. Yeah. I don't know about Nova, but I think Neo would have been better. Nah, I'm not a fan of Nova, but like, I mean, Neo also makes sense because it's like, oh, it's a, it's a new, new take on Mega Man. Like, it fits. Mega Man Legends yeah. doesn't even make any sense, like, if you really think about it, especially in the context of the game and compared to, like, the previous entries in the Mega Man series. Like, it, it's totally nonsensical. Anyway, that's fine. Also, it's crazy that the N64 port came out so much later. Like I have to imagine that the the poor scores had a lot to do with that. I would imagine so. And I didn't play the N64 version of this game. I know we have community members specifically Discamera aka Game Over Hell. They played the N64 version and says it controls significantly better. But you have to think the 3 year difference and the 3 year gap and and technically like the game being developed Probably the majority of 1997, probably dipping back into 1996 in, in an era where the Dreamcast was dead. I think it was discontinued by the time that the N64 version came out. But all the games that came out in between that, you, you have to think the, the PlayStation 2 is out. Uh, the GameCube was ramping to come out. Yeah, like we'll, I'm sure we'll get into it in the gameplay. But when you consider everything that was happening in gaming in 2001 and how this game plays, I, I could definitely understand why the scores were as low as they were. That That is understandable. What I'm kind of amazed about, and uh, once again, we'll talk about this, is the, the reviewers had a problem with the graphics and how this game looked, which is just baffling to me. Mm -hmm. I, I don't get it. For shame. Yeah, I don't know. I, wanna, I don't want to give too much away, but like that being their criticism of it, that's just what that's i don't get it I, I don't get that at all the mechanics i can though i i can agree let's get into the personal experiences since we're already kind of dipping into that anyway randall you suggested this game 
you nominated this game for us to play for the for for this patron poll. So how about you go first, man? What, what's your personal experiences with this game? I just like recommending and reviewing uh, games from my childhood uh, that I remember very fondly. I guess the next one would have to be Final Fantasy VIII. No. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you want to, I'm just no. It being an ass. No, those like those three games. So like the Harry Potter PS1 game. I'm not even kidding. Mega Man Legends and FF8. Those were like the three PlayStation 1 games I was allowed to play. Because the PlayStation wasn't even mine. It was my sister's. Mm. So we'll start off with that. But it it being one of my biggest childhood games. And it was also the first game I ever completed when I was a kid. The second one being uh, Pokemon. I think it was Pokemon Red. I remember very vividly the day that I completed the game. I see it in, in a haze a vision, if you will. But I was struggling a lot with the final boss of this game. And I forget how old I was. I was really young. Uh, and I had been struggling literally all day to beat this boss. And I give up because I die again. I walk out into the living room. My sister and her friends are all sitting out there smoking weed, just kind of chilling. And I'm sulking. And they're like, oh, buddy, do you, uh, you still having trouble with him? And I was like, yeah. I can't beat him. And without saying a word, without saying a word afterwards, they all got up except my sister. She was like, what, what, what are you guys doing? The three dudes walk past me into the bedroom where the PS one is. They all sit down. And for about 25 minutes, I walk in there and they're just, they're doing like the puff, puff pass and they're, and they're passing the controller too, just trying at it. And it only took them about a half an hour and they, they ended up helping me beat the game. But I just remember it because without even asking, they were just like, nah, we're going to help this little bro out. But we're also <laughs> going to get our tokes in. I feel like maybe that's why the memory is hazy. You probably had a contact high. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. I don't know. It's a very awesome memory that I have of this game. Uh, does it blind me with uh, like heavy nostalgia goggles when looking back on it? Sure. But that's why I played it again now that I'm uh, much older. It's been multiple decades since I officially played this game. Yeah, that final boss is a bit of a bitch, too. So, like, yeah, no shame there. No I, shame I there, think but. I had to have been like seven or eight, like when I beat the boss. So I was bad at video games. But yeah, so that's my personal experience with it. That's a great memory, man. Yeah, maybe maybe I maybe we can smoke some weed and play Mega Man Legends someday. I would probably prefer gummies, <laughs> to be honest. <laughs> All right, Shane, mm. how about how about you? How about you follow that one up? I mean, I can't. That's a hard, hard act to follow, I mean, especially considering my personal experience is currently ongoing. Uh, <laughs> no, I struggle to remember if I'd even heard of this game back in the day. I don't, I don't think I did. Um, so I, I really had no exposure to it. I don't recall anybody I know playing it. Never really saw anything about it. I mean, a big part of that, right, has to do with the fact that I never owned a PlayStation which I've brought up several times on the show before. And my exposure to the PS one was renting the console along with like a couple of games for a weekend every so often from the local game store. So um, never really had a chance to play this one. I think without having the context for like what the game is, I'm also not surprised that I would have never had a reason to search it out because much much to chris's chagrin i know i've never really been a huge mega man fan it's just not really been my style of game so if if i had seen this i probably would have been like yeah that's a pass just based on like what i knew about mega man so yeah no i i really had no experience with it until you know it was nominated and uh summarily chosen by our patrons and without spoiling too much, uh, I got to say, I'm happy that uh, it was picked. And I'm pretty sure that if I had played it when it came out or thereabouts, I'm fairly certain this would have been probably on my top list of games for sure. Like hmm. th there's there's a lot going on here that 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 I vibe with. I don't know. What about what about you, Chris? Were you were you aware of the legend of the rock man? This was a, from what I remember, day one purchase for me when it came out. Ooh. I got this game. I bought it. I ate it up. Never beat it for whatever reason. 
Uh, for for some reason, I keep thinking like there was more options to upgrade my my Buster while I was playing through this game, like the the regular standard attack. And like I, I remember making it pretty far, but I just don't remember ever beating it for whatever reason. I think I just wanted to spend time grinding for Zenny, which uh, seems to be a, a common thread with some people who play it for whatever mm. reason. And mm-hmm. then I just happened to put it down, you know, seeing that came out in 1998. I can kind of understand there's a lot of big games that came out that year. If you're a was a 13 year old at the time, like you're you're swapping to the newest, hottest thing. If something just grabs your attention. So that could be a big reason for it. A lot of things going on in my life. Uh, a lot of big games, big, big games coming out that year. And of course, like Mega Man Legends, I, I did love it and I have fond memories of it. I have fond memories playing it, but. <sighs> Is it really like the top echelon games of 98? Uh, I don't know. Uh, so it's 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 one of those games that you can definitely afford to put to the side when there's like a, a glut of amazing games. I'll, I'll say that right off the top. But I have extremely fond memories of this game. Uh, I remember playing it with some of my friends because they were excited to play it as well. Uh, I've mentioned this on the podcast before. The, the friend I would go over and spend like every Friday night is sleepover at just playing video games and eating pizza. That's what we did. And like Mega Man Legends was one of those games for a while. A lot of fond memories of that. When Randall talked to me about what games he was going to nominate, when he said Mega Man Legends, I was extremely excited. And I couldn't be happier that was nominated to go back and revisit it and give it an honest chance and and make it all the way to the end. Uh, Unfortunately, I don't have a PS1 original disc. I had to play it through my PS3 when I bought it a while ago. And that might contribute to some of my frustrations on the gameplay when we start talking about that, which we will be. Uh, very soon overall like yeah this is this is a game that i i definitely look back at my childhood and say yeah this is this is a title i remember and there's probably a lot of games i don't so that that said that says something about the quality of the game in when it came out and i'm actually kind of shocked at the the scores and the aggregates in our brief history that it it got that low because i really think a lot of people that played it during that time remember it a lot more fondly than those scores would indicate I think it 100% had to do with other 3D games that came out around that time. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And then they were like, it just doesn't play exactly like this game that was super fun. So clearly Capcom is just smoking something stupid. (laughs) What were they thinking? Well, I mean, again, 1998 was a monster year for video games. I mean, when you compare this to Ocarina of Time, I don't know. That's a like, that's yeah. a bad example for me because I'd be like, I play Mega Man Legends <laughs> like I would play it a hundred times over before I would play Ocarina of Time once. I probably Ooh. would too. Yeah. Oh, I see. I'm outnumbered here. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm just listen. I'm I'm just saying that Mega Man Legends could benefit from from fucking Z targeting. Is all I'm saying. You're not wrong. Yeah, there's a lock on button, Shane. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. That, <laughs> well, I mean, we are going to talk about it, but you know, we if, will. <laughs> we're not going to. Oh my god, we will. <laughs> we will definitely talk about that. But before we do, let's get into the plot and writing of this game, and I'll just give the basic kind of snapshot overview of this. You start off learning that this world, I guess, it's post-apocalyptic. They don't like it is entirely yeah. say that. Okay, so it is post-apocalyptic. And the world's covered in water and you have these people called diggers, which is kind of funny, which is the way they ask you about it. They are looking for refractor shards in order to power the world. And everyone's in search of the mother load. And this leads your team of Rock Volnut or Mega Man Volnut. They don't call him Rock. What's a a roll some mechanical term and her dad barrel. I guess it's her father. I guess rolls his girlfriend. Or they're just, I don't know how this works. So Mega Man's adopted. Okay. Oh shit. It's like a, it's like a step bro scenario. (laughs) It is. It is. a (laughs) Jesus Christ. Yeah, it is actually. It is. (laughs) Oh no, Mega Man. I'm stuck in the van. (laughs) No. no. Oh my God. With the monkey. With the monkey. (laughs) Just bongoing away. So if I remember all the bits correctly, it's Roll's parents. They disappeared. Uh, Yeah. The grandfather took her in and then they found Mega Man and then adopted him before I get the, the questions about that, because there's there's questions. I mean, it's it's more than just her getting back to the overarching plot here. They get to this island 
Kettlock's Island. And there's this prophecy that this island is going to like explode or go away or whatever. But it's mostly peaceful island. And there's all these ruins that people haven't explored, even though they get diggers license and whatever. You show up there, your ship crashes. And all of a sudden you start figuring out that there's pirates on these islands that's after a major treasure. So you have to go stop them. And in the process, you uncover a a plot to destroy all the people of the island and take over the world because that's what the island is for or whatever. That's the basic plot, which was prophesized. Now, as I said, this is Pokes apocalyptic. So I have, I have questions. Mm-hmm. I have a lot of questions. I mean, the plot itself is pretty basic. Magman's got to go save the world. Mm-hmm. Got it. The people on the island are people. Mm-hmm. People, people. Mm-hmm. Well, Mega Man's a rabbit. Uh, mm, kind of. <laughs> is it, he roll? Is roll a robot? No. Okay, roll is roll is a people. Mm-hmm. I thought they were like cyborgs. There you go. Not so. Well, not it, roll. Well, <laughs> god damn it. The so the bit is is that um, and this is just kind of in general how Mega Man like eventually works. Like, just think of it kind of like Astro Boy in a way because like they're very analogous. Mm-hmm. But it's people can replace parts of themselves with robotics, but a lot of the more advanced robotics have replaced parts of their bodies with organics. So Mega Man is organic, but mostly a robot. So he's like cyber. It's like a cyberpunk dystopia, right? He if I, yeah, it's like Shadowrun. There you go. He's like ten, he's like ten percent organic 90 percent robot while like roll and her her grandfather are like the other way 90 percent human 10 percent robot doesn't yeah i mean her her grandfather has more robot than roll i would imagine uh, yes. but at the end of the game mm-hmm. i'm not going to spoil it spoil it but at the end of the game it's inferred that Mega Man is a straight robot and everyone on the island is a human it mm, sure I mean, I'm not going to split hairs with you because he he does have I, I organics. I, That's why he looks the way he does. I know it's it's just so weird because everyone on that island is a pure human. Yes. And they never make mention of the fact that this dude is a is a robot. It's like not it's not brought up. Well, it doesn't compute because it doesn't matter, I guess. But he's just he seems to be the only one that's like that. Aside from their colorful cast of pirates, which are brilliant. I love the pirates, by the way. Yeah, they're fantastic. Well, I don't know, because if you remember, what's his toast? One of the pirates, uh, the one with the white hair. Can't remember his name right now. Teasel. Diesel. Teasel. Teasel. He's, he's just like Mega Man. He's like his face is the only thing that isn't robot. Right. Yeah. But Tron is not a robot. But Bon Bon is a bon robot. Bon is pure it's robot. It's pure, yeah, robot. pure robot. Pure that, robot. But that's yeah. what I mean. That's why people don't go oh what the fuck's going on with that it's like it's just a thing but i mean yeah. mm. you're already kind of digging into my problems with the plot and writing it's i'm a digger <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> it has a <laughs> my problem with the plot is that this whole game is front loaded and back loaded and there's just air in between yes no i agree yeah, it's there is an exposition dump through a text crawl, through cutscenes, through NPCs talking to you, and then there's the game, and then there's the end of the game, which is a text crawl, some cutscenes, and then that's it. No, I think you're 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 spot on. You're 100 percent correct. Yeah, the beginning is like it really establishes the characters, uh, the the, the semi antagonists, not the yeah, I guess the antagonists, the pirates. They're very well developed. I would say like they're the best developed characters in this game. Uh, the bonds they're fan like yeah. Tron bond is uh, Tron bond and Tiesel there. They are just very well crafted. They're extremely entertaining. They're your, to- your typical slapstick kind of antagonists. Like they, they can never get right. Even though like their plans aren't bad. It just seems like they're, they're foiled by the fact that you're there. If you weren't there, they would have been completely successful and the surf bots are adorable. But I think that, yeah, the, the beginning, the opening really establishes the world and then everything between just like, let's go search for treasure. Mm-hmm. And there's no real rhyme or reason to it. And then you get to the end and then it's well, just like, but there is typical though. anime bullshit. Well, well, go ahead. Yeah, OK, but there is, though, right? Like, it's I'm not saying I mean, it's it's thin, but it's there. I mean, the whole yeah. reason that you're 
searching for shit in the first place other than the overarching plot with the pirates is to fix your damn ship right like you're trying That's to true. find stuff to the crystals to, to fix your ship i'm actually surprised you both are saying that because i i actually felt like the story pacing was really well done in this there were the the like little story beats i thought were sort of interjected at just the right pace that you know you do a little bit of your dungeon crawling such as it is or some of the stuff topside um with some of the quests involving some of the characters like the mayor or whatever and then you'd have another little cutscene thing with things progressing with the pirates introducing them sort of like one at a time and i don't know i thought those were like interlaced throughout the gameplay in such a way that like I never felt like there was much of a lull with the exception of the part where I had to get to where I'm farming to upgrade my weapon, but that's right. not entirely yeah. necessary, but I'm doing it. Other than that, like the natural progression of the story, I actually thought was pretty well done. I'm just talking about like the end of the game was just a, and maybe this is what more Randall's talking to, and this is what makes it feel like that, that middle part being really thin is that mm. the end of the game is just this typical anime super exposition dump. Yep. Yeah. That you don't see coming. It comes out of left field and it, it makes it sound like the entire reason you're doing everything. It should have been leading up to this. And you're like, I, I guess, but there's just so much here. And what? Like <laughs> all at once you're going to give this to me and then it's over. And then it's like, oh, yeah. And then they just kind of ignore it. Kind of well, uh, because there was there's going to be a sequel, but like, yeah, go ahead, Earl. Uh, so I, I would say they don't necessarily ignore it because you get the whole exposition dump and the fact that the exposition dump happens. Even the main character is kind of like the fuck. But this came yeah. out of nowhere. Sure, bud. And then the end of the game <laughs> happens. And then later on, another one of the characters goes, and this explains the reason you're like what the fuck and it's like wow um okay yeah sure. big big plot top. I'm, I'm talking about like they kind of forget about it after that gets explained oh well because they smack you with a to be continued because capcom yeah, was much. feeling it <laughs> well it's a Mega man game it has to be continued right well it's just like oh yeah man this game's a 100 percent game a fucking sequel yeah, yeah the the end antagonist uh, that that just kind of comes out of nowhere is lame. But they, mm -hmm. they say like, oh, there's a prophecy. Oh, the island's going to be destroyed. But there's no real mention of it until the last 30 minutes. And that's where you get all the explanation for it. And that's that's kind of what, what I'm what? talking about. I think what? that's what Randall's talking Did about. Did we play different games? What the fuck? What? They, they talk about the prophecy throughout the entire game. No, they talk about the prophecy. But like when it gets all explained and what it is. Yeah, it's like. A okay, million well, things the, the, at once. Okay, no, that's fair. What I was saying is the way that you're saying that, though, it sounded like you're saying like, oh, there's this prophecy, but they didn't mention it till like the last 30 minutes of the game, which is not true, because if you talk to the NPCs, they're all just like, I don't know, it's like this legend, this shit's going to happen. Don't know what it is, but sounds pretty bad, but it hasn't happened yet. So we're all cool, but you're here. And there's pirates and things, there's earthquakes and could be bad. So, it like, it, it definitely gets brought up. Yeah. It, just to kind of build off the point of the NPCs thing, I will 100% admit the NPCs in this game do make the game feel more filled out and lived in. And they do mm, true. have they do have interesting dialogue most of the time. Most of the time. And so, yes, they do. They do try to fill in some of that information a little bit. But it's not like there's no explanations for things. It's people just kind of like it, it to me. It just felt like, oh, I'm having a thought bubble. But instead of having a thought bubble, I'm just going to let it roll out my mouth. Well, I mean, I guess if if I'm sticking to the side of defending it, because like, apparently that's where I ended up. I might argue that perhaps part of the reason that you don't get that information is because nobody actually knows. Yeah. Fucking touche. Yeah. I mean, that's an entirely reasonable but when you do find out like i said it's just 30 minutes find out start to finish game ends yeah so i, I don't know if there's more that we wanted to talk about about the sort of pacing of the plot i feel like maybe we covered that fairly well mm -hmm. yeah yeah I, I would agree that it's paced well so 
Yeah. It's just front loaded and back loaded heavily. Yeah. But no, I mean, so uh, apart from that, right, for talking about the the writing and things like that, by and large, um, I'm actually a pretty, pretty big fan of the writing in the game. It, it's not consistently like top tier quality. I mean, there is definitely some throwaway NPC dialogue, whatever. But I think by and large, I think the writing is really well done. It's pretty compelling, particularly with the uh, with the pirates, the bonds, like their dialogue is just fantastic and like the interactions that they have the the peanut gallery nature of the surf bots oh yeah while like teasel is over there pontificating about his like fucking next grand master plan and they're just talking about like this coffee tastes great very interesting with the surf bots like after this game they become the the official mascot of of capcom if i remember correctly like they're like minions yeah they were minions before minions way before minions don't ruin this for me. <laughs> At least they look cuter. I'm surprised Lego never sued Capcom over this. Yeah, right. I'm surprised. They're straight too. up Legos. Like, I don't know how, how they got away with that. But I think the reason why I complained so much about the plot was because I was like, I'm already invested in this like whole theme. Please just give me the juice. The writing's good, but it's there. There's a lot, a lot to be desired for me. So I'm going to continue to be a Debbie Downer on that, on that point, I guess. But yeah, I mean that's fine. It's your childhood game, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to split the difference here because why not? I like the writing. Like I really like the writing throughout. I mean, if you exclude the the beginning and end, and you just view this game as kind of like an anime, it has a lot of plots of kind of like a a mid-level anime like a lot of those those tropes and kind of those downfalls but if you just like enjoy what's happening in between like the writing is great i i do i'm with shane here in the fact that i do like the communication between the bonds i i love that and i've said that already i think that the bonds are absolutely delightful i like how this game is so wholesome Mm -hmm. it's just a very wholesome game it's cozy yeah it's very cozy Again, it's very Japanese without being overtly Japanese. I think that's the best way I can explain it. But like that, that's kind of how it's told. You're you're chilling around the community. Everyone likes you because you're doing everything. The uh, you can do these little side quests where the where the writing is interesting. You know, getting to know the lead investigator of uh, the police department over there, and even the mayor and her relationship with you and your grandfather and everything like that, and and just communicating with them and even making the donations or when you're just having communication with the random serve bots throughout town and they're like oh i'm up they're like butters it's like (laughs) talking to butters like evil butters and it's just that these are moments that like make this game feel alive i think you're right about that real it feels lived in it's surreally fun like i'd love living in this i would want the serve bots to be there because even when they do bad things they're kind of like yeah we don't really mean to but we do. They're just trying their best, man. Yeah, they're trying to do their best to support the pirates because they're doing pirate things. That's what pirates do. But, you know, like the pirates aren't really bad. They're just trying to be bad. And I think that can that comes across really well. It's such a delight. I, I think this is the high point of this game is how this game is written, how it's presented. And this is what makes the game special. This is why you'd want to go back and play this game is to experience that writing. Flaws aside from how the ending, it just kind of wraps up too quick and presents itself overly, very over aggressively. Uh, aside from that, I think the, the, the totality of it is what I do love about this game. This is what this is about. Uh, hmm. Aside from uh, other things, which this would be a segue unless any of you have anything more to say about now. Fuck writing. your segue. I'm not done yet. Oh, damn. OK, go. <laughs> No, but I, I totally agree. And I think one of the important points to make here, too, is the attention to detail. And it is, this actually won't be the last time I bring that up because it applies in a couple different places in my mind. But speaking about like the NPC dialogue and the interactions, et cetera, there's a certain level of like care that went into that that really does show. And it, it's a it's a minor thing in the grand scheme of the game, but it really adds that level of i'm not going to say realism but i guess immersion right like just little things like talking to like the bakery owner in the in the town and then the i think it's like what is it a pastry or donut shop like right across the street from her yeah like you talk to her and she's like 
sort of debating about like, eh, maybe her bread's good. Maybe I should try it. You know, it just like little shit like that, where there's this implied relationship between these people as if they really live there, you know? And so it's just those little things like that, that I think really make it for me because it'd be real easy to just throw a bunch of static NPCs in there and they just say, hello, I sell cupcake. Would you like cupcake? But like adding that extra personality makes a huge difference. Mm hmm. hundred percent. Anything else you got to put on this, Randall? No, not really. I'm pretty down on, on it all. And you guys are bringing it up. So I'm gonna let it stay up. I'm gonna let it stay up. Cause I am still very <laughs> positive about this game. So just I'm gonna mm -hmm. let that go. All right. Well, let's move into, I, I don't know how positive we're going to be here. So it's, it's going to be an interesting mix. I'm, for seeing let's move on to the gameplay and what we think about that shane since you've already mentioned mm. you're playing this while you were you're recording the podcast what, mm -hmm. are, what yeah. are your thoughts about about the gameplay here so at first i thought i was going to hate it uh because well first of all a couple of our patrons said that i'd probably hate it <laughs> mm -hmm. the the words tank controls usually get a viscerally negative reaction from me generally speaking but you know what uh, all, all things being equal, it's actually not that bad. The way that it was implemented, like it's still definitely a little janky, not going to lie. And for the most part, I haven't found it to be too problematic um, because there aren't a lot of cases in this game where you need to have like Twitch reactions to things. So I have to imagine that that was intentional given the the limitations of the control scheme that they had available at the time because okay i suppose i should give context if you're not familiar with how this works there there's no dual analog there's no fucking analog stick at all actually it's d-pad and shoulder buttons so you move with the d-pad front and back and then left and right you kind of like slide left and right strafing. so there's no turning there so you're strafing yeah and you turn the camera with the shoulder buttons a little clunky and it takes a little getting used to but it's in my experience it has not been that problematic with like one seriously notable exception and that is the the fight against the pirates when you were on the airship yep and you have to try to shoot down tron when she's in that like red jet thing fuck that boss holy fuck fuck that, that boss. sucked so much yeah because it's it's she moves so quickly and she's carpet bombing you and it's so hard to try to simultaneously n turn yourself with the shoulder buttons but then also like hold the the free look button to then use the d-pad up and down to change the the camera like height the tilts up and down to find wherever the fuck she is and then actually try to hit her. You're like, you're basically holding like three or four buttons at once to accomplish this. And it fucking sucks. Yep. You didn't use the claw. No, 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 oh. no, I did not use the claw. I will say that the, I was the active buster so, or active blaster. Mm -hmm. The ass blaster. That one with the homing. Yeah. The homing yeah. missiles that helps a ton on that fight. If you have it leveled up, you're supposed to have it for that fight. If I'm not mistaken, like, that fight is so much more difficult to do without it. And by the way, you reacted to that, Chris, it sounds like uh, you had it, but you were sad. No, I did have <laughs> it, but like I didn't upgrade it. So I was using the machine buster, which is also a fantastic weapon because it does a lot of damage very quickly. Mm -hmm. So if you're able mm -hmm. to if you're able to track down that boss and you're able to look at it, that's fine. And I'll say like overall, like the way it controls if like navigating through dungeons, because this is kind of like a dungeon crawler at heart in a way because you go find dungeons you navigate your way through dungeons and you fight enemies and with the exception of that one little fucker that charges at you with this with this drill hand mm -hmm. enemies are mostly manageable but the downfall of this game is really its bosses in terms of how you control and this includes the final boss mm -hmm. because there's there's two ways of doing it there's that wolf boss which, by the way, the R2 button, which is what you use, is not supposed to be a free look button. 
It's supposed to be an auto track button. Yeah, that's horse shit. And for whatever reason, the auto track button just makes up its mind when you can track enemies and when you can't. Just randomly decides when you you can't lock on to an enemy. That's like a big fucking problem for me. If you're going to call it a lock on button, if you're going to like and this is before Z targeting. I, I get that. Like this game was developed before Ocarina came out, so there was no Z targeting. But if you're going to tell me this button locks on to enemies, it better fucking lock on to enemies when there's only one fucking enemy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's only one. <laughs> yep. Why can't I lock on to it? Did you tap it? It, it, it doesn't matter. It won't do it. Mm hmm. No, don't don't uh -huh me. It just won't. <laughs> I've looked up YouTube videos of this to make sure I wasn't doing shit wrong after I beat the boss. Like I, I did all this stuff like, am I doing this wrong? No. Even the vi YouTube videos I'm watching facing that wolf fight, they're getting semi wrecked. Well, because they have problems tracking the boss down and the auto targeting doesn't work. Like that's horse shit. Oh, straight up. I turned the auto targeting off for that fight. You, you, there's no option. No, no, no. There is an option. There, there is a free look mode. But I didn't turn it off. And it still was forced into free look mode. Hmm. Th that's the thing. And I'm confused. Bosses kill this game. Mm -hmm. Bosses kill this game. And in the final boss, it, it just pretty much goes down to if your controller is working right. Mine wasn't. I was not using a PS1 controller. I was using an aftermarket controller because I was playing this on the PS3 and my Mad DualShock Cats. 3s first. No, it's not. Well, it's not Mad Cats. It's better. Than, it's not, oh, God, it's not Mad Cats. <laughs> And the D-pad's okay. It's not the best D-pad. I mean, the, the PlayStation controls aren't really made for D-pads anyway, really. But my DualShock 3s are kind of hosed. A lot of it just boils down to holding down one of the camera buttons while strafing. So you run in circles around the enemy and just continuously fire your weapon and jump at the right time. Yeah, I was waiting for one of you to finally mention it. It's like a lot of a lot of the boss fights outside of the ones where you're you're stuck on a platform is circle strafing. That's all you're doing. You're circle strafing yes. and firing yep. your gun. I actually, the boss, or I guess it's a boss, mini boss, I don't fucking know, but the one with the three wolves or whatever, mm -hmm. that fight was actually super easy because if you just circle strafe, you, you basically avoid all their bullshit. And I took them down in like no time. That's definitely the tactic. And the thing is, is like, it gets a little, you, you gotta, you gotta practice that a little bit, right? Because it's in order to like circle strafe, but also keep, your aim in the right place. You kind of got to get used to running in the right direction, but then also kind of like tapping the shoulder buttons to keep your view like in the right spot mm -hmm. because I, I'm not fucking relying on any auto targeting that this game purports to have as indicated by the fact that evidently I was using that button as a free look. Yeah. I don't know what's up. I did not have a problem with it. Maybe it's just, all I literally did to get it to work for me was I just tapped it. Like if I double tapped that button, it normally would lock onto something that was in front of me. Imagine like a box inside of my field of view. It's like if it's in this box, he, he will, Mega Man will lock onto it 100% of the time and I will be okay. Now when it came to boss fights, like the wolf fight, the flying Tron boss, the one that she pilots the wolf one yeah but shane also said there was i think it's called like fucker wolf <laughs> fucker wolf <laughs> <laughs> let me look up the official name anyways outside of that one and it is fuck wolf yeah i'm pretty sure that it's 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 german word it's not pronounced that <laughs> falk wolf <laughs> yeah falcon wolf yeah i mean what was the name of the actual ship the fucking gesundheit or whatever <laughs> uh, it starts with a g gessel schaft yeah, 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 that one. The, the, shaft. The, the Giselle Shaft, that one. Yeah, oh, she my. flies the fuck wolf. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she does. So anyways, <laughs> outside of like that boss and there was another one, but there were only two bosses where I didn't use the lock on just because it just wasn't like useful. But the, the other parts about the gameplay and I, I, I kind of want to just take it back to like a general statement. I 100% believe because I read this somewhere. It was just on like a, one of those old game fact things and being like, man, I can't believe how similar this is to the original like Mega Man games. It's just in 3D because you're jumping and you're shooting. That's it. That's all you're doing. You're jumping and you're shooting. No. Wow. Like, well, it, boiling it down. That's all you're doing. With the no. with the bosses and with the dungeon crawling, you're just running around. No, 
jumping and shooting. No. 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 Uh, no. 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 <laughs> I, <laughs> no um, with a question mark? <laughs> no. I mean, it's, it's way different, in, in my opinions, because you have... You can equip different things onto your standard weapon, which makes your standard weapon more powerful, have more range. You can shoot faster or have more bullets come out at once as opposed to like your three pea shooter or whatever. There's a lot of different variations that you're going to have to manipulate, especially when you're like grinding for Zenny. Mm -hmm. I hate to bring that up because you will have to do that if you want to level up some of your weapons. But like you have to make sure your range is good. You have to make sure your attack is high and all these things like that upgrading your your secondary weapons is not like you get weapons from bosses you have to find them you have to do mini games to find some of the upgrades to your to your items which all are very manageable except for for one which i rage quitted uh, i couldn't even get it on the easiest difficulty because i couldn't figure out what the game wanted me to do and that's the uh when you get like the slider shoes mm -hmm. where you can go faster mm -hmm. and you hold down circle mm -hmm. and then they're like yeah go play this mini game where you can you know roll around you have to get through this obstacle course which is fine until the last one and then it was just like go fuck yourself i'm like fuck this i'm out and it keeps you from getting the best weapon in the game if you don't do it and i didn't do it so i'm like i'm out because the active buster is good enough and that's your secondary weapon that's what you upgrade to like through zenny that's why you have to grind through zenny so it's it's not at all like the original Mega Man because the original Mega Man, you could select the order of your bosses each boss had a weakness depending on the bosses you defeated and that's not what Mega Man legends is it's a very linear experience you experience through getting various weapons and upgrades. And I don't want to say Metroidvania because it's not Metroidvania. God damn it. I knew that that was going to come up at least once in this episode. It's not a Metroidvania. It does have but Chris. You get upgrades that allow you to go places you couldn't go before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not dealing with that. I'm not. No, it's not Metroidvania, but you do have items that do allow you to go into different areas so you can get various treasures everything's a metroidvania of course it fucking is <laughs> <laughs> some of these things are also mandatory and i i guess in terms of a gameplay sense like i, I do have a slight complaint with that uh and because i do like this gameplay for the most part outside of the some of the bosses i'll say uh, right up front like i, I do enjoy it mm -hmm. but the bosses really soured me but one thing that i do want to knock on here in terms of the gameplay is some of these items are required to beat the game like the spring jump yes and another mm -hmm. one but like you get them pretty unceremoniously like it's it's not like a, a barrier where like oh yeah i gotta get this like you gotta find it kind of going off the beaten path nah. you're talking about the drill arm right yeah well you need that for those walls yeah yeah that's required to beat the game yeah there's there's some of them that are just you get very unceremoniously Mm -hmm. that common sense wise yeah you'd figure this out i'm not saying i wouldn't figure this out if you just explore but that's that's kind of a detractor i i'm like if you need an item to beat a game and not to go explore and find additional treasure i think it should be like mandatorily you're funneled into finding this stupid thing and Mega Man legends doesn't do that you can say for better or worse uh some people may like that that's just something i don't personally in enjoy but mm -hmm. i did find it so i'm not complaining too hard uh, but I did have to do it mm. by not necessarily going just through a dungeon and trying to make my way through the end. Yeah, I mean, I can see what you're saying. I, it's a tough one because I'm I'm inclined to say that I don't feel like it's much of an issue. But then again, like you, I I just found all of the pieces naturally. So like it it wasn't like a roadblock. If if that had not occurred and I wasn't being thorough in searching um for items and i got basically like cock blocked in my progress of the game with nothing to indicate why or how to fix it mm -hmm. then yeah i could definitely see that as being a problem so i i think i would tend to agree i feel like if this was something that was going to be remade at some point which i i actually think it should be i think it deserves oh, the, oh, I, I agree yeah absolutely yeah i might that might be a quality of life change maybe Maybe you don't have to like, don't go fucking all out and put like a goddamn quest indicator or some shit. But like, at the very least, you could have roll or something give you little hints or something. I mean, because they kind of have that with data where like you can ask him like, hey, what should I do next? So like maybe if they flesh that out a little bit more to add some more additional hints to things like that, that could probably be enough. Maybe mm -hmm. on the other side of that argument. 
there's part of me that actually does kind of like the way that this was implemented because it feels very organic. So like going into these little dungeons and poking around in like the holes in the walls and finding treasure chests and things like that. And I think that's part of it. And this is part of what kind of hooked me into this because I fucking whatever spoilers for the end or whatever, but I actually really enjoyed playing this game like way more than I thought I would. I think that's part of it is you don't just straight up like find the item. You don't just like open a chest and it's like, here are your spring boots. Like you, you actually have to find pieces like you would if you were going like treasure hunting in some ruin of like, oh, you found rusty springs and you found this other piece. And then you bring it back to roll. And she's like, I don't know. I can probably fuck with this. And then she puts some shit together and she's like, here's some boots. And I kind of like that loop. Like it's, it feels really rewarding to sort of like organically find these things and then bring them back and have roll be like, cause you don't know what you're going to get from it. Right. At least in your first playthrough. And so you go talk to her and she's just like, oh yeah, I can use this. And then she gives you a cool new item. Like that felt really good to me. Like I know when I got the spring boots specifically, I was like, fuck yes, finally. Cause like, I remember seeing, you know, ledges and shit that are like, I mean, I know there's something up there, but I can't get to it yet. And then when I got all the pieces and she made those for me it was like a really rewarding thing so yeah yeah i'm just saying as as a noted zelda hater i just think zelda does it better <laughs> yeah, sure i mean it, it definitely like just fucking hands it to you it, to your point yeah i mean to your point it does definitely funnel you to those like critical items a lot more than this game does for sure um, I, I have some thoughts about the boss encounters, but I don't want to jump to that in case we have anything else we wanted to talk about with the current topic. Randall, do you have anything to add? Because Shane wants to get to the bosses, but do you have anything you wanted to speak on here? I will say, even excluding the complaints about it being tank controls, about the lock-on system not being fun or good, even, the gameplay itself, the combat, I have read plenty of people being like it's boring it's dumb it's whatever it's like i actually find it to be very good and the fact that mega man throughout the game gets more powerful feels great the fact that you can see your character become more powerful is great the, the, the fact that you have more utility to address certain combat situations with different tools is great just wanted to throw that out there. I actually entirely agree with you. I mm -hmm. I a hundred percent agree with you on that. Yeah. yeah. I mean I, I love the upgrade system, like the the ability to like have that degree of control over your busters like stats and swapping parts out. Mm -hmm. And to the point where I thought I was going to like just swap in the best items and just be like, okay, cool, I'm fucking done. But there were actually a couple of places where that wasn't the case. Like I, I actually didn't use range very much because I valued the other three stats more because I felt, and it seemed to work out for me that having like the highest attack and energy and rapid seemed to have the best results. Um, cause I didn't have too many issues with getting closer to things. And for context, rapid obviously makes you shoot faster and energy gives you more bullets per like, round of shots but there were a couple of instances like some of those boss fights or things like that where i needed the range and so i was like oh okay let me swap my loadout a little bit so there was definitely it was more dynamic than i expected it to be yeah and not everything's a simple solution because you're not given like the best items up front i mean an easy mm -hmm. mode i think you can because there's there's different difficulty levels in easy mode i think you get the best item right off the get but in in normal mode and and higher yeah you have to vary up your approach and how you get into certain situations based on your buster loadout and that's cool I, I i really think that's that's a lot of fun and that isn't just for bosses that's just how you navigate through storyline dungeons and stuff like that mm -hmm. and that's where it, mm -hmm. that's why i don't think it, it's really like a traditional Mega Man game when when randall was saying he was reading a review that says it's like an, it's Mega Man in 3d and it's like no there's so much more customization in terms of what you can do and how you approach situations that are just base level things that aren't required to go beat a boss or have weaknesses or anything like that. It's just you encountering a situation, what strategy works for you, what loadout works best for you and 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 play the game like that, which really goes to what 
you know, Inofune was looking for in terms of bringing in RPG elements because you don't have an experience system. You don't level up everything you have to find or purchase uh, and and including your life. You have to buy all of your life upgrades. You have to buy all of your E-tank or re or a canteen tank is what they call it in this game. You have to buy all of that and or you don't find it. You have to earn it through Zenny collecting. Mm-hmm. And all these things are like that that's super cool like you go into you go into situations with the way that you prepared yourself so if you're not prepared enough that's on you and i completely respect the game for doing that well and it definitely like buys into this whole treasure hunter notion right because you are quite literally delving into these ruins and coming back with pieces of random shit and like loot that you find and you use that to you know, upgrade your, your gear and things like that. So mm-hmm. that's that, that gameplay loop, like uh, maybe unsurprisingly, given that I'm a pretty big ARPG fan, mm-hmm. that whole, uh, delve in a dungeon, get loot, repeat thing kind of, kind of works for me. So, right. I wanted to build off of what Chris was talking about because we've been, we've been talking about like grinding for Zinni and everything. So there's a side quest in this game where the detective has you chase after a car. Mm-hmm. Mm. In this car is some surf bots with a case full of money. The whole point is you're supposed to blow up the car, the surf bots drop the money, you give the money back to the, the detective. It's all hunky-dory. But you can and should just take the box and walk away. Because it gives <laughs> you like 200,000 zenny. It does. Yep. Which for me carried me through most of the game. Like that, that bought like most of my early game upgrades, and then I didn't really have to farm. It certainly helps. The reason why I say you should do that is because the only thing that affects is a system that was never really fleshed out in the game, and and it's mostly because of the RPG mechanics in terms of like NPCs talking to you. It was supposed to be more in depth, but they just kind of abandon it. I think in development, but there is a karma system. There is a hidden karma system in Mega Man Legends where your armor either goes lighter or darker, depending on if you do good things like completing side quests for NPCs and all this stuff, or it goes darker whenever you do bad stuff like blowing up vending machines, kicking cans into people's bakeries, stuff like that. Can't get the dog though. Well, I was just about to say in the Japanese version, you can. Oh. Not That's only cool. can you kick the dog, you can kick all of the animals in the game. <laughs> and there's a scene where Tron, she's up a, a lamppost being barked at by a dog. Mm-hmm. In the American version, you talk to the dog and tell him to go away. Mm-hmm. In the Japanese version, you can punt that motherfucker halfway <laughs> across the street and he just runs off. Like there's a cutscene. You kick him and then it switches to a cutscene instantly and he goes flying. <laughs> But it's the same interaction. Like, she's still like, oh, my God, Mega Man, thank you. And it's just kind of like, bro, he just like nearly murdered that dog because he was barking at you. This is a pirate. She's not going to care about the well-being for the dog. It's very funny that whenever they brought it over, they immediately went enough with the animal abuse. (laughs) We're going to stop that. But that's like another thing. It's like kicking animals also decreased your karma, which darkened your armor and a at one point, like NPCs were supposed to shun you, like shop shopkeeps weren't supposed to sell certain stuff to you because your karma was so low. Mm-hmm. But that just didn't make it through. It did not make it through. So the reason why I say just take the money is because it only it it immediately takes your karma to like negative one hundred or whatever, so your armor becomes as dark as it possibly can go, but nothing happens. So just take the money, and then throughout the rest of the game, you're your armor will immediately lighten up anyway. Hmm. Makes sense. Interesting. You can't do that side quest until late in the game, though. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, I didn't I didn't know that the morality system actually wasn't fully implemented because like when I so, OK, I started my playthrough of this game on our Sunday stream and mm-hmm. I was told by a number of people in the chat like, hey, you, you shouldn't do that stuff because you get you get bad karma, man. Like you shouldn't do it. And I was like, oh, I didn't realize this game had like some sort of morality thing going on. But apparently it doesn't matter that much. I mean, to be fair, I definitely kicked the can into the bakery at least a few times. That's a thousand zenny. It is. It is. Which is great at the beginning of the game. Well, <laughs> yeah. That 200,000 zenny sounds real nice until you try to upgrade the active blaster. Holy fuck. Hold on. Okay. Okay. <laughs> to be fair, I, I get uh-huh. it. 
Yeah. Because the final upgrade is 990,000 zenny. Yeah, it is. But that, yeah, it also, is. that also breaks the game. <laughs> you are saying, I am willingly breaking the game because that gives you unlimited amounts of shots with an item that auto targets and does massive damage. Mm-hmm. It's a beam. No, that's the laser eye. That's, are we thinking of the same thing? This is like the, the homing thing. Oh, yeah. Maybe I'm thinking of a different thing because the, the beam for me is like. That's the that's the winner right there. Oh, I think that's the laser thing. And I did wasn't able to get that because there's that obstacle course I was talking about that can fuck right off. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was just the two two bits there. If you guys didn't have anything else with that, I think Shane, we can finally talk about the bosses. Yeah, get into the bosses. Oh my god, can we? No, it's fine. Um, no, I, I didn't really have a whole lot to say. I just the the only thing I wanted to point out because I feel like it wasn't maybe super clear. So I, I agree with Chris's take on it that uh, the shortcomings of the control scheme in the game are definitely a lot more apparent during those boss fights, by and large. But I think a big part of that is because they're more mechanically involved. And that's the part to me that's actually a huge bummer because I actually really like the boss encounter design. Them being so different and having these like specific methods to defeating them, I thought was really cool. I'm also actually really glad that they explain it because I fucking hate it when games do this where they're just like, and I will 100% admit that. 3D Zeldas do this all the fucking time where they're just like, all right, here's a big boss. Uh, this is a really specific way to fight it, but we're not going to tell you. So figure it the fuck out. At which point I usually just pause it and go look up the solution because I don't have that kind of time in my life for that bullshit. So I do appreciate that this game, like right off the get, is just like, hey, this is a boss, motherfucker. This is what you got to do. You shoot those tracks and then he's going to be real slow. And then you jump up on the thingies and you shoot it at the door. I'm like, okay, I can do that. So I actually like the boss encounters mechanically. I thought they were interesting and they're not just these like lazy sort of like it's an enemy, but bigger. So I do like that. The thing that I don't like is the fact that I think the encounters themselves are dragged down by the game's controls. Yeah. I, I I would agree. I would say it, it's very interesting based on how you approach certain bosses, how easy some of them can be, like with the, mm. the, the fucking wolf or whatever, like having having uh, homing stuff definitely helps. I guess, would it be like the second major boss fight? It's like when you fight D- Diesel in his, um, in his tank thing. Yeah, that's clever. I like that boss fight. Yeah. But you can completely trivialize it with the mines. Mm. Sure. Yeah, that's if true. If you get up there and you just spam the mines, even while the serve bots come out, it just instantly gets rid of them. You can end the fight in like 10, 15 seconds. Like, it's just done. <laughs> well, that, yeah, but that's, that's the thing. When it comes to loadouts and exploiting the game, I think this game is ripe for it. Oh. Yeah, I love exploiting. It was a positive. Okay, okay, okay. Got it. Cool. No, I, I agree. I like, there's always ways to exploit it. And that second wolf fight, I was thinking about ways to exploit it, too. And I was following a guide, and I did like the guide's, guide's advice, because if you don't do this, that, that fight's a major pain in the ass. I learned, I learned that quick, because when enemies rush you and get up all in your shit, it, it sucks. I will say that. One of the tactics it, it, it said is taking the grenade launcher, which you need to get there anyway. You need to have. And if you've upgraded it at all. You can just sit in the elevator while all three rush at you. And then when they get close, you can just com- just completely cheese the fight by spamming your secondary weapon and just throwing grenade bombs at them until they get close to death. And then just like do your circle strafe around them until they die. And that's pretty much the best strategy. It's and it's, again, it comes down to preparation. And that's what's brilliant about this game. 100 percent agreed. But yeah, when they when enemies jump at you or try to get in your face and Then the camera decides that it's going to shift to show the enemy and then come back to you and then have you face a wall. So you have to hold down one of the shoulder buttons in order to reorient yourself. That's that's not fun. Right. That's not fun. (laughs) And 
I don't necessarily have any more opinions about any of the other bosses in the game because most of them are kind of they're either whatever to good. I do find some of the bosses to actually be good. Um, obviously, the diesel fight, it even though you completely can trivialize it, it's still a well-designed fight. Yeah. Uh, actually using platforming and all that stuff. It's neat. Is it time to talk about the last one? The last fight? Mm. Shane, uh, can, can you talk about it? <laughs> I mean, you go on, you, you, you go on ahead. Okay. Um... <sighs> Circle strafe. <laughs> Circle strafe. Hooray. Circle strafe jump. Circle strafe jump. Or if you're like me and you've saved up 990,000 zenny uh, to, to fight the boss, hold triangle. <laughs> yep. Uh, the, the, the I beam does the same thing. Just stand still, kill it, done, walk away. Yeah. So, I mean, either way, I mean, it's. If you go in there and you try to fight that boss straight, you're going to get wrecked because I got wrecked because that manipulating the camera on the final boss was was a pain in the ass. Trying to learn the patterns was a bit of a pain in the ass. You can do it. And I've I've watched the videos. I've watched how people can take this down. There is a pattern to it. It's not incredibly difficult once you can wrap your mind around exactly how to control Mega Man in that situation. Uh, but like by that point, if you're not explaining the game for the money, in the Zenny and you don't have the best weapons in the game, then why not just take advantage of it? There's no reason. Just go in there, cheese it out, beat the game. Right. Or make it hard for yourself. Whatever you enjoy. Uh, that's that's up to you. But I, I totally cheesed it because by that point, I knew it was up with the bosses, especially because a lot of the strategy for that boss was getting all up in your shit, both versions of them, because it's a, it, there's two forms to the final boss. Right. And it was just get in your face, especially the second part. And whenever the, the boss gets in your face, if you're not circle strafing or creating distance the entire time, uh, you're you're going to get blasted for a while, uh, especially if you don't come prepared with a with a good canteen and a shield repair item. So, yeah, there's that. I approached it like you do every Dark Souls boss. Hug the left ass cheek. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much. I just melted him with an OP weapon, and, but. In my memory, those three dudes token it up, they definitely just spun in circles. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> they, they, what, they figured yeah. it out having not played the entire game. They were like, Oh, I've never touched this game before. And they were able to just go, Oh, okay, this is this is simple. Run circles around it. Mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts, Shane? Nope, that sounds good. Yeah. <laughs> not, now he's gonna <laughs> he's gonna let us know those pro strats. That's right. So let's get into the game's graphics. How does this game looks in terms of its visuals? Randall, you haven't started off a section yet. What do you what do you think of this game's graphics? I think it is the best looking PS1 game ever. Whenever you look up like retro uh, remakes nowadays, like the indie games that it's supposed to look like from the PS1 era, they mm -hmm. look like Mega Man Legends because that's the attractive PS1 look like the the. Angles are harsh, but they're also stylized. Like even the character models, they're done in like the, the textures for the character models are an anime style. So them not having perfect facial movement, just having really, um, I mean, it makes it simple. You essentially just put a anime texture face over some polygons and it's just like, oh, wow, they're super emotive, even though there's not really a lot happening with the model itself which is brilliant by the way yes yes that these these are probably some of the most uh anti animated characters that i've seen in a playstation one game because that they use it to like its fullest extent i love it and also this game is so beautifully colored it is so mm -hmm. vibrant mm -hmm. I mean, it does remind me of Mario 64 because Mario 64 is also very like colorful and beautiful. They took like one of the best things about it and just how colorful it was. It definitely didn't look like a drab game. Yeah, no. So that's like my big gush about it. It doesn't suffer from any frame rate drops either. No, it doesn't. Especially with games that do look that good from the PS1 era. Like sometimes you would run into those hitches never ran into that the draw distance was never a problem yes there were there was a draw distance that you could see but 
when they had to use it, it was like in a foresty area, so you could kind of like uh, what is it? Suspension of disbelief. It's some it's a misty morning type deal. The the Silent Hill solution, right? Texture warping didn't exist. Uh, I never saw anything that I'm that I'm used to seeing. The only if I'm going to have a negative, it is a lot of the buildings are just square. It's just a square. Yeah. There are some buildings that do have, and they're the important buildings that do have a, sh- like a different shape. And that's kind of how you can tell an important building away from a non-important one, I guess, is they do have a unique shape. Yeah. But it's not even really a complaint because they still make even literally a cube with the textures that they put on it. They even made those look great. So I, I'm going to agree with you a lot on this one, Randall. I wouldn't say it's the best looking one ever because there's probably plenty of PlayStation games I haven't played. I I think games like Gran Turismo 2, Omega Boost, Tekken 3, I think those are examples of games I'd I'd say technically look better. And this is all personal preference, of course. But this game looks amazing. (laughs) It goes back to the facial animations on what they do with these character models. I was blown away by how smooth it was like this is this is not a what i would consider a late playstation game at all i mean this is like a mid mid mid-gen playstation game so yeah like 1997 this is when developers were really starting to get into the feeling of what they could do with the playstation but technically this in, in that aspect this predates metal gear solid this looks better than metal gear solid that might be a hot take this game looks really good. And one of the things that it reminded me of while we were playing through this is like this. I was like getting reminded of Signalis. And how it looks so much like Signalis. This is a modern game, which, by the way, we talked about it over on Tales from the Backlog. Go check that out. Shout out to Dave Jackson. But this is this. You're right. This is what people look back on from with that PS1 nostalgia. And they say this is what games look like. This is how we want to create a game that can get that can fuel that inner nostalgia with the people who are playing it so it can be reminded of that era. I I won't say it's the best, but it's definitely probably the most representative of anything that the the PS1 was doing throughout the entirety of the generation. When People look back the fact that I was playing this on my PS3 and my PS3, when it when it gets up, it kind of upscales it to 1080p onto an lcd and it doesn't look as good as an crt it's not going to but like it came through clearer than any game that i've that i've played through my ps3 in terms of being a 3d game and it looks so good i was looking at this like damn man i did not expect this game to hold up the way it did and i think the way they developed it like a lot of self-contained areas focusing more on the character models than than the environments but keeping the environments smartly designed and managing draw, draw distances really well. And I noticed this in one of the, more of the open environments, like one of the, uh, one of the greener environments on the, on the top world, because in, as opposed to the other world, which is like the the dungeons, I would call them dungeons. I, I would say they're pretty bland. Uh, there's there's not much really going on with them. They're uh, samey throughout the entire dungeon that you're going into, making navigating it kind of difficult in a, in a way if it wasn't for the map. But the, the hub world. I would notice like if there was a house in the background, like it would start off as like a gray, not mapped polygon structure that kind of looked like a house, but it would be fogged out. And as you got close to it, it would get more and more developed and it would scale like really well to the point where you get up to it and then it would get the fully fleshed out polygon model. And a lot of games can't do that well from this era. And this game did. And it just hits all those notes just appropriately. Is there texture wobble? Yeah, it's it's there and it's noticeable if you're looking for it, much like any PS one game would. Uh, I noticed it mostly on like City Hall in the town or a lot of the buildings like the windows would would wobble in and out. But like you, you got to be looking for it. Other than that, yeah, this is like a PS one PS one game in terms of how it looks like if I want to tell someone what what people think of the when they think of PS one graphics, it's Mega Man Legends. Like this is the hallmark of the the PS one's identity in terms of its visual fidelity. Mm-hmm. Uh, what do you think, Shane? Yeah, no, I generally agree with everything you guys have said. Um, I, I think the big thing here is that the developers, I think, were really playing to the strengths of 
the console. They weren't trying to make it do something that it couldn't do or couldn't do well. Additionally, and this this is related to things that we say all the time when we're talking about 2D sprite work, you know, sort of like holding up a lot better generally than early polygonal stuff. But I think the the concession, I guess, with that is that the artistic approach that they take, I think, is important. I don't think it's necessarily that hot of a take to say that this looks better than MGS. And I think a big reason for that is because one of these two games was going for a realistic look. And spoilers, it's not Mega Man Legends. No. <laughs> the realism approach almost never ages well. I mean, you could take, like, if you're looking at the N64, take Mario and put it side by side to Goldeneye. Like, as much as I love Goldeneye, goddamn, those NPCs <laughs> look horrid. And it's because you, they were attempting to make it look realistic and that ages like milk and so this game does not suffer from that artistic direction goes a long long way in how a game looks and how it holds up i think more importantly and they made a lot of really smart decisions here and one of the biggest ones and randall came right out the gate with it and i'm glad that he did because i definitely wanted to talk about it was the facial animations other games have definitely done this. I know we've, we've talked about it before on the show, but I think this game takes it to a whole other level. The animations, the 2D animations, that sprite work that happens with those those facial mappings are so well done that they give you the illusion of depth, like specifically with Teasel, like when he's talking and he has this because he, he usually has his mouth fucking wide open because he's a cartoon villain, which I love. <laughs> but like as he's talking the the shading and everything that is done in the mouth area makes it look like it is a three-dimensional like object like it's part of the model even though it's not and they even went so far by the way and I, there's only one time where i saw this and it was in a cut scene with with Tiesel, where his head kind of turns to the side and he's talking to someone and they actually took the time to like mask out the part where his mouth is so that it looks so it's transparent so you're not just seeing like a flat 3d object with a mouth texture moving on it from the side they actually made it look like his mouth was open like they put the transparency in there to give that effect and that again goes back to that thing i was talking about earlier with the dialogue it's those small little touches and attention to detail and the care that went into it that makes all the difference in the world i know for some people it probably sounds insane that i'm taking this much time to point out like one little thing that happened for like a split second in a cutscene, but i think that's kind of like indicative of the game as a whole is that there was a lot of care that was put into it and it really makes a huge difference yep let's take that and let's move on to the audio and uh, Shane, let's keep it with you. What what did you think of the music and sound design of this game as a whole? Oh, I love it. Yeah, I think it's very well done. I mean, you two were humming one of the fucking tunes. Like, <laughs> yeah, I don't think I have too much to say on it. Um, so I'll try to stop from just rambling. But <laughs> suffice to say, I I don't think there's really a whole lot that I could point out as being a negative. Like, I think the sound, the music is great. Actually, I take that back. There is one thing, and that is, I actually wish there was a little bit more of it. There are a few instances in some of the dig areas, like the the dungeon areas, where it's like too quiet. And I think that was one of those instances where the use of silence maybe was not so great, in, in my opinion. I feel like there should have been a little bit more backing music happening. It, it felt almost a little hollow, but... That's a minor gripe, I think. Other than that, I, I think it's great. Like the and the sound design itself is is awesome. And since this is we're talking about sound and everything, this is also a chance for us to talk about the voice acting. Mm. So I don't I don't want to go on too much of a tangent here. So I'll I'll leave space for other people to make some comments. But I I do want to say that by and large, I I actually really enjoyed the the voice acting. And for something that was like a mid ish nineties mid to late 90s game the voice acting quality is actually surprisingly good like there's there's a few instances like some of the police officers for the town that are 
phoned in, I think. Not great. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, but by and large, I, I think most of them are actually really well done. Um, I have one specific thing I want to mention with Mega Man's voice, but I'll get to that in a second. Okay. Uh, Randall, I will go to my grave saying the best town theme ever, ever. I don't care. Any game is going to be the Apple Market theme. I love that theme. The music in this, when it's there. Because they do, as Shane mentioned, they do use a lot of silence in this game. I I actually like all of the silence that they use. I never really, when I played it, I never really noticed when it was too quiet. And I think that's that's when silence is good, is when you don't notice that it's too quiet. The, like, the subtle, uh, like, in the first area, as soon as you get off the ship and you're allowed to start playing the game and you head to town... There is no music. I found that great. But I can see why some people might not like it because it's just like, I, I would like a, a, a change up to this. Monotonous is not the, the term I'm looking for. What is it? Repetitive sounds. Because it's going to be, it, it's the same like two sound effects when he's, when he's walking around and you're going to hear that a lot. Yeah. To kind of put a pin in the rest of my points, the, the sound design is very um it's very punchy and i would consider all of it to be almost metallic um when i'm thinking of sound effects that happen in the game all of them do have a very sharp end to all of them and i think it just kind of lends to the theme that this world is you know kind of based around uh m- just metal hell yeah <laughs> metal <laughs> so i i don't think i'm going to be as positive as the two of you have been that doesn't mean i'm going to be negative because i overall i think it's the sound the sound design is fantastic i would go harsher into the the use of silence i don't think it was incredibly appropriate mostly for the dig sites i think i agree like i love the town theme i don't think it's the best town theme of all time but i i would hold it up there among the most nostalgic themes for me of all time i hear that and i instantly get happy i love it like but is it as good as like the the first town theme from Xenogears? I I don't I don't, I don't think so. But is it one that I like just puts a big smile on my face and like takes me back to my childhood? Oh yeah, absolutely, one hundred percent. I love that town theme for that reason. And I I would more lean into what Shane said: is the music is good when it's there, and sometimes in these dig sites, like the story dig sites, like the things you have to do to fulfill the plot, like the dark purple ones. They like have this dark foreboding music track behind it that doesn't really Mm -hmm. fit the feel of the game. It's just out of place like it. Nothing feels too dark in this entire game. So why have this weird, super dark music in the background? It just it doesn't fit. I didn't like it. I didn't care much for it. But like, let's get into the voice acting because that's that's the most negative things I have to say. Voice acting is brilliant. Uh, brings the characters to life. Uh, I, I've already talked about how much I love the Bonds, and one of the reasons I love the Bonds is because the fantastic voice acting performances that were given to them. Uh, same with Mega Man Roll. Uh, they they their voice actors are fantastic. It sounds like they're Canadian, by the way. I don't know if either of you picked up on that. Uh, I I totally noticed that. Yeah. yeah, they're they're totally Canadian voice actors. There's there's accent examples in there, like the way they say again is again, and there's. The, the subtle times that you can notice it when they say about or stuff like that. Uh, very stereotypical ways that a Canadian would say these things in a very, very Canadian way. Uh, but yeah, I mean, they they did a fantastic job. I mean, what else? What else you want me to say? I already said like the plot and, and just how the characters are and just the entire way that this world is brought to life by those characters and the characterizations that they do bring forward is one of the reasons I love this game so much. It wouldn't be that way without the, the voice acting performances. There's just, they eat the scenery. They, they just suck up all of the attention to anything they're doing with these voice performances in a time where that was not expected. And I, I got to give all the props to the voice acting man. And I like the, the sounds that you said, like uh, just the general sound design is really good because it does remind you that Mega Man is in a robot suit, so it sounds appropriate. Everything sounds like it should. Uh, and that's probably an accomplishment in and of itself, because this isn't necessarily something Capcom kind of done with Mega Man before. So good for them. But man, that voice acting, man, the characters, I, I give it 
It's not like for the NPCs, it's not the best for, for the main focal characters that you spend the most amount of time with that the plot circles around. I love it. Uh, and the serve bots like they are some of like the best bad voice acting like it's intentionally bad. And ah, uh, if it wasn't intentionally bad, I'd like this is like you took the people from Resident Evil and took those like you took the voice directing the voice directors from there. And they're like, you know what? What you selected for voice acting for Resident Evil and how we're going to direct there, that wasn't exactly what we're looking for for that type of game, but we have just the title for you. That's what <laughs> Mega Man Legends is. It's fucking fantastic, man. That's why I want people to play the game is just so they can for historical, if not just for historical purposes only and be like, this is what this is what made it so games could come along to what they are today. Uh, it's just it's a brilliant performance for 1998. Uh, that's what I'll say there. Uh, I absolutely love it for the sound. Yeah, I think the the like sort of over the purposefully over the top voice acting coupled with, you know, the really great facial animations that we were talking about earlier makes this feel like you're playing like an episode of like a, a Saturday morning like anime or something yes. like it's it's. It's yeah, it's it's got that vibe and I really love that. I think that the one last thing I wanted to touch on about Mega Man specifically and and his voice actor who I fortunately don't know who it is, but um I want to give props to them because I don't know if this was a, a directorial decision or if this was just something the voice actor decided to do. Either way, it's again, it's one of those like small things, but I just like when it happened, I was like, "Oh, that's that's so good." When Mega Man is reading uh, some of the the text in one of the like dungeon areas because he's also confused as to like why am I able to read this stuff? But he's reading it back to Roll because obviously Roll can't see it. On like the more complex words, like he stumbles and like sounds them out and shit because he's he's a boy. Like so obviously he's not gonna know how to say like anthro unit whatever. And so like the voice actor actually took the time to make that sound realistic like that where he like stops and like sounds out words as he's reading them and that's just that's so fantastic like you don't you don't see that happen that often in in voice acting and that decision was just mm, chef's kiss love it the the voice actor's name is Corey Seaver all right well Corey Seaver you did a beautiful job like that that one I mean overall though the voice acting is pretty great but that one spot there, it was just like, hmm, so good. Corey Seaver has, has quite a filmography. Props to you, Corey Seaver. You did a great job. This is, their, this is his only video game credit, too. Wow. Wow. That's surprising. He was 13. No shot. Holy shit. Yeah. That's even more impressive. <laughs> okay, then that just, then that also kind of makes sense why it sat, probably sounded so natural. It's like, how in the fuck do I actually pronounce it? <laughs> <laughs> you probably didn't know what the fuck the word was either. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now it's time for our patron pontifications. If you want to participate in this, all you got to do is become a patron for $1 a month. That's just $1 over at uh, patreon.com slash retro hangover. You can also find the link in our link tree. Head on over to our Discord, which is free for everybody, by the way. You do not have to be a patron to join that. In fact, you should do that right now if you're not already and you have a Discord account. We would love to have you there. But then there's a section called Patron Petrifications. You can go there and give your opinions on an upcoming game for a future episode that we tell to everybody. Our first pontification is from Discimera from Game Over Hell, the YouTube channel, which I highly recommend. And Discimera says, when I first played this on the Nintendo 64, it almost made me feel like I was playing Brave Fencer Musashi again. That's actually a good comparison. It shares some of the charm and progression structure, although the voice acting doesn't. Well, you know. OK, that's me. <laughs> Never owned it, but rented it often when I still had the console. I already knew it was just rebranded for the Nintendo 64, but that didn't matter. It's extremely easy to clear it quickly, even with the strange control scheme. And I think the replay value the secondary weapons are supposed to offer is way too reliant on time consuming money grind. 
but it's still one of my favorite games from that generation. The narrative and colorful character design is an excellent representation of a Saturday morning cartoon equivalent of early to mid 90s anime. If you're into that, it's a very comfy experience. In spite of being very short, there's a hefty amount of optional secrets and side quests as well, some which I didn't find out until my latest playthrough a couple months ago. I've said this before and I'll say it again. Aside from sounding worse, the N64 version is the better one to play, if you have access to it. This was supposed to be a pontification, but it sounds more like a summary of a review. Oh well. Thank you, Discamera. There's a lot of points that we touched on there. Some uh, we, we agreed with, some I'm not sure we disagreed with, I'm not sure, but very good pontification all the way around. All right, next up we have Matt, a.k.a. Stormageddon, from the Fun and Games, Reignite, and Screen Snark podcasts. And they say, I played this on PS1 as soon as it came out. I loved it then, and I love it now. The controls are for sure a little clunky, but I love the world, the characters, and the story. This one is an all-timer for me. Thank you, Matt. All right, and the next one is from Alt, and they say, The cover art is a travesty for both of these. I wish I had realized what the game looked like in-game, as I now adore the art. At least it doesn't look like the American box art of the OG Mega Man games. One day I'll find time to play Legends 1 and 2 and Tron Bon, but it might require turning into Mega Man Volnut after I sell body parts to afford the three games. I actually really like the cover art. Just gotta sail the high seas, man. The, the Japanese hmm. box art, unsurprisingly, is far superior. Oh, well. At least I think so. Sure. Sure. Mast <laughs> Keaton, the runner of our high score challenge, which was the Rekka Carnival 92, whatever that's called, Rekka 92 Summer Carnival, whatever. I'm getting, I'm just talking too much. It was a great time. But Mast Keaton says, I haven't played it. I hope you enjoyed it. Does it have anything in common with the Mega Man franchise, or did they put the Mega Man name on a generic game to sell more copies? Uh, yes and no. I say no and also no. <laughs> yeah, no and also no. Does it have anything in common with the Mega Man? Well, it does have stuff in common with the Mega Man franchise. It has Mega Man and Roll in it. True. It's also got fucking Wily as a boat merchant. I didn't mm-hmm. even mention that. <laughs> oh, is that Wily? I didn't think of, I yes. didn't notice that. Yeah, Wiley's boat. Yes. It says it says Wiley on the building. Oh my god! I always thought it said Willy. Willy is spelled with two L's. Yeah, and I'm dyslexic. Fuck you. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> I just blew Chris's mind. I have to look this up now. Oh my god, Shane, you've sent him down a dark path. Oh my Dude, god! It was, it was like an offhanded comment, and now <laughs> it is Wiley's boat shop. Yeah. What yeah, the? It is. What the? F- oh my god! He even has a similar haircut. It does. Yeah. No way. Chris. He, Chris is in shock. He is in shock. I, don't I know. am in shock. And it, it it's just Doctor Wiley with the with the. He's like a tall and buff Doctor Wiley with a like eye patch, but yeah, he's sexy yeah. now. He's a he's a salty sailor. Oh. They just turned up the sex appeal on him. It looks like an, a very elder <laughs> Daniel Day Lewis. <laughs> I've abandoned my boat. Anyway. All right. Wow. Anyway. <laughs> Damn. All right. Back to you. Back to you, Shane. Ah, oh, shit. Where were we? All right. I unintentionally sidetracked us there. Uh, let's see. Where are we at? Oh, yes. MQ Keith of the semi late, but still somewhat breathing main quest podcast. And Keith says. You might think I'm lying when I say this, but I wasn't always a cynical contrarian. I do think you're lying. I couldn't wait to see many of my favorite classic franchises make the leap to 3D. Even after having played the bad ones, my excitement never waned. I remember Mega Man Legends foremost for its charming cast of characters, strong setting, and timeless art direction that made it feel like I was playing a Saturday morning cartoon. Juxtaposed to what Mega Man X became, I wish I could have given you my thoughts on the gameplay, but I haven't played it in almost 30 years, and I'm sure it wasn't the flawless transition to 3D that I once thought. But I'm sure you and your guest will do your due diligence on that end. Either way, I'm in love with the idea of one day revisiting Mega Man Legends. Well, I think you should. Last but not least, Ash Event. And they say, since this wasn't Mega Man or Mega Man X, 
and was actually a new character, I wasn't freaked out about it going 3D. I was able to look at it like a new franchise, which is exactly what it is, or this is my comment, was. Now, having played both, if you got to choose one, the PS1 version is the way to go for sure. That's an interesting take. I'd, I'd really want to play this on the N64 just because I think analog controls would greatly enhance the way this game plays, but I, I would need to check that out. Thank you, Ash Event. And by the way, go check out Ash Event's Instagram channel. It's, it's his channel? Page? I don't know. Uh, go check out their Instagram. It's fantastic. All right. So this is where we shift over to what our thoughts are. And I'm just going to hijack this because that's what I do. Uh, and I'm going to go first here with Randall going last because our guests go last with the final word. And also, there's going to be a reason I'm going to go first because I think I'm going to kind of differ from the two of you. So what do I think in terms of does this game hold up today? Uh, no. It, does, it, it doesn't hold up today. And, I, and I'm going to say this. Loving the game. I love this game. I absolutely will defend this game in every other aspect except for the fact of whether or not this holds up today and whether or not I could recommend this to a modern day game player. I think the controls are just a little too clunky. And I think something that Shane said earlier rings 100 percent true in that this needs a remake with modern controls in order for this game to really shine through about what it was trying to do. There are just too many times where I would just be holding down the L button button and try to run to the left or right. And then I'd run backwards and I'd have to stop firing my weapon. And then I can't move around when I'm doing my auto auto target or free targeting, whatever it wants to do when when I'm, I'm using that. And there's just gameplay controls that don't hold up to the modern era enough that for me to say that this really is a product of its time coming out without analog controls, coming out without that free camera control that really hold it back in terms of bringing it forward into the modern era. Uh, I, I just want to reiterate, I do love this game. This is a big game from my childhood. And much like Matt did say, uh, this is one of those old all timers for me in terms of, of PS1 game. But if I was going to recommend this to a modern audience, I know this is Shane's first time playing it. It sounds like he's going it sounds like he has some high opinions on it, but like just in general, it's just there's times it's just too clunky. It's it's too hard to control. It's too hard to do anything that you would expect from a modern game or how a modern game should perform. And I played this with a controller that did have an analog stick. I was like, why can't I use this? I wish I could use this. It, it, it's just breaking me. So with all that being said, I'm just going to say no, I, I'm not going to sugarcoat it any more than that and i really want this to come to modern consoles in some form or fashion where i can control it like a modern game would so it could have the brilliance i think it really could have and i think a lot of people would enjoy it just for the characters and the environments alone all right shane what do you think uh yeah so mm, okay it, it's a little tough because i want to just come right out the gate and say yes because I, I actually do like unironically enjoy this game a lot. It is a rare occurrence, I feel like, where we talk about a game that I don't have prior experience with that I really like fall into and get absorbed in. And this is one of those games. It's just something about it just clicks with me. And I, I really, really like it a lot. So it's it's hard for me to not just straight up say like, yeah, you should go play this. And the only thing that is holding it back, as Chris said, really is the controls. And it's not it's not even really the fault of the game. It's just kind of what they were working with at the time. I do genuinely hope that there is an HD remake or remaster or whatever you want to call it for. Well, honestly, I, I don't have any context for the other ones. I'm at some point I'll probably get around to playing the other two. But like a, a trilogy remaster would be like fantastic because I do think that the the control scheme for this game does it a really great disservice because underneath that, if you can get past that, you have a really fantastic experience. And 
I, I will also put it out there that I think it's the, just the right length also. Oh, yeah. It doesn't, oh, it doesn't overstay its welcome at all. You can blast through it in about, you know, seven hours. It's not a huge investment. However, it gives you the option to get more involved if you want to. And I think that's the difference for me is that I like having the option to really get absorbed in a game, but not a requirement. A game like this, like an RPG, like this could have very easily been a 30 hour game if they wanted it to be right. The structure's all there. It's got the RPG elements. It's got the dungeon crawling. It's it, it, it totally could have been a much, much longer game. But I'm really glad that they did not go that route. Because I think it does exactly what it needs to do. And then it gets the fuck out of the way, which a lot of games don't do. So I really appreciate that. But then it also has all these little sub quests that are not immediately obvious. But if you want to, if you like the game enough and you want to take the time to go dig in deeper, there's more for you there. And having the option, I think, is fantastic. So all that to say, do I think it holds up today? I'm going to say yes, but with like a, a boulders worth of salt in that you need to be okay with getting accustomed to the tank controls. If you are okay with getting the feel for that, eventually, for the most part, and I said this before, it does, it does feel fine. Like you get used to it. And I, at this point, I don't really have an issue, but there is a learning curve. If you're willing to take that learning curve, I think you have a really rewarding experience on the other end. If you don't want to take the time to futz around with archaic control schemes, then it's probably not for you. All right. Randall, you have the final word. Mm -hmm. Does this game hold up today? Uh, yes. Period. <laughs> Does. Yep. 100%. <laughs> I would agree that the controls do hold it back from being like, like, oh, yeah, no, this is just the biggest recommend ever. Um. Yeah, the tank controls are a bit of a bitch to get used to. There is no denying that. Even with the rosiest of tinted glasses, those controls do take some time. But this is a PS1, like as PS1 can get. And whenever people ask me, it's like, oh, I want to get in to playing older games. This is always one. That, uh, on a list of ones that I would recommend like it always is because it it has that aesthetic by the balls not to ramble on too long because you guys did cover like the negatives and the positives very well um, it's just you, there is no getting past uh, how much of a capsule this game is for me um, and what I think it is what it could be for other people that remember that era of gaming it's like yeah you you look at it you play it you go this this is what it was like and this is what it looks like to play games from that time and then whenever you want to and as i said before whenever you want to pull from that nostalgia and you model a modern game after it this is one of your biggest things to to yoink from in terms of look in terms of feel I would always recommend this game. Does it hold up today? Yes. Well, well, there you go. I think we, I think we ran the the spectrum there. We we have the the no, the the yes with some caveats, and then the fuck you, go play this game. So <laughs> there it is. There it is. That means that we are coming to the end of our episode here. Which means, hey, thank you, Randall, so much for joining us man it's always a pleasure when you're with us it's always a pleasure when you when you join us and of course thank you for being a patron and thank you for being you know with us for so long you were you you weren't like an og og but like you've you've been with us like since we had like what like five people you know listening to the show being a patron everything like that so it's always good when you can stop by and you know, give your opinion, especially in a game that was so close to you as a, you know, childhood memory and everything like that. So, so thank you so much, man. It's no problem. I always love coming on. And uh, now that I've thought about it a little bit, instead of uh, Final Fantasy VIII, if you guys ever want to talk about Croc, um, I'd be, be oh, 100%, yeah. I'd be 100% Croc. 
Yeah, and interested in that one. Uh, problem is, is that that is a 3D platformer that also has tank controls. So <laughs> I'd play it for sure the Saturn. Does. By the way, that's how I'd play it if we had to play Croc. <sighs> fine, fine. <laughs> but like the PS1 version, bro. No, I I sincerely uh, appreciate being invited on. It's always a fun time. But yeah, thank you guys. All right. Well, uh, I suppose we should ask. I mean, I, I don't know if there is anything, but we we always do ask this. So. Uh, before we go into our mandatory spiel, schlocking our wares, uh, is there anything out there that you would like the people to know about, Randall? They should definitely join the uh, the Patreon. I guess I could shout out like all the other podcasts that uh, I definitely participate in and shill RHPN. So let me go ahead and go down the list. So you should listen to Pixel Project Radio uh, with Rick Firestone. Yes. The, the yeah. most badass the last, last name. name. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So uh, you should go listen to that. You should go listen to the good and the bad and the backlog. Absolutely. With uh, with Adam and Kieran. And then you should also go listen to um, both shows on the tube, which is the top three podcast with Dave Jackson and his uh, so- semi solo thing. Tales from the backlog. I would also say uh, the Deleted Saves podcast. That's another one uh, oh, yeah. that I've been listening to. I haven't shilled RHP on that, but I will shill podcast on here. So there you go. Go check all those people out. They're wonderful. And there you go. And uh, both Rick and Dave have been on our podcast. So go through our episodes. You can find them. I know that Dave was on a couple of our episodes and Rick was on one recently. He was on Final Fantasy VI. So yeah, they've been friends of the show. Definitely. You can hear Dave on COG 96. Maybe you'll hear Rick on a future COG. Who knows? Pay attention. Stay tuned. And deleted saves will definitely be on one of the retro hangover shows in the near future. So, yeah, good recommends. Absolutely. All right. Well, (laughs) speaking of King of Games and things like that, though, uh, though that is on the main feed like right now. So we're hoping that everybody is enjoying that. It is not the last one. Spoiler alert. We've we've got more in the pipe. Five by five. And uh, if you want to get in on that action before anybody else does, then I would suggest following Randall's sage advice and joining the Patreon. And how might one do that? You might ask. Fortunately, I have the answer for you. And it is very simple. Imagine that we make it easy for you to give us money. Crazy. (laughs) So if you want to do that, uh, as well as find all the other stuff we got going on, if you want to check out the merch store or our socials or the YouTube or Twitch channels or all that good stuff, it's all in one place. So all you got to do is head to linktree slash retro hangover, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash retro hangover and uh, tap tippy tap the, the button that tickles your fancy and uh, you will be whisked away to something that is related to us so there you go and i I usually say this and i didn't yet but if this happens to be your first episode we're glad that you're here we hope that you enjoyed this discussion um and we do have a a pretty sizable amount of content sitting out there we are closing in very rapidly on uh episode number 310 years of being a show uh so there's definitely plenty of stuff for you to check out so i highly recommend doing that you know, if you don't have anything better to do with your time. And uh, let's see, Chris, what would you like to tell the fine people at home about? I'm not even going to be specific. Maybe it might be something else. We might surprise them this time. Who knows? No, not really, because you should go to twitch.tv slash retro hangover and see us do some streaming. If it's not a holiday or there's not a wrestling pay-per-view or something like that. (laughs) Or we don't feel like it, whatever. Yeah, whatever. (laughs) We're not getting paid for this. Okay. Well, the Twitch. Uh, So just if we're streaming, we normally stream on 9 p.m.'s 9 p.m. <laughs> Fuck me. Uh, Sundays at 9 p.m. We stream on the 9 p.m.'s. Uh, on the 9 p.m.'s on the Sunday. Very nice. Very nice. Uh, so head on over there. We'll be playing a game of some kind. And we hope to have you join us for that over at twitch.tv slash retro hangover. 9 p.m. Eastern time. Sundays. Great community. Head on over. It's it's raucous. You'll have a great time. Uh, and that's all I got. Back to you, Shane, at the 9 p.m.s. Uh, well, with all of the 9 p.m.s now being <laughs> said, speaking the words, 
Until next time. Play with your... Oh, no. Don't do that, step rock full nut. Joysticks. Shane here with a quick message. You know, the one rule Chris and I have always gone by regarding advertisements is this. It has to be something we use and can personally vouch for. If you know me, you know I love coffee. And Bones Coffee Company has been my go-to for home brewing for quite some time now. Their small batch beans come in an impressive variety of flavors like Mint Invaders from Chocolate Space or Electric Unicorn, which I swear tastes exactly like Fruity Pebbles. And the best part? No added sugar or calories involved, just natural flavors infused right into the beans themselves. Build your own sample pack of five four ounce bags to find out which flavors speak to you, or jump in head first with full 12 ounce bags. They've even got K-Cups. Step up your homebrew game with Bones Coffee by visiting bit.ly slash RHP Bones. That's B-I-T dot L-Y slash R-H-P-B-O-N-E-S.